Uh, thank you, Zena, for the introduction. Um, uh, good evening, and thank you all for being here today. Um, allow me, just before I start and we start talking about the past, uh, just to take a minute to express how uh, honored and grateful I feel to have been included in the Question of Syria event for uh, this year, 2016, so meticulously organized by the very, very wonderful people at uh, Space, uh, namely uh, Zena and Murhaf. Um, I am honored, truly, to have been uh, included in this impressive lineup of uh, speakers, of Syrian speakers, uh, whether activists, uh, scholars, and writers. And to them, and to those among you who are Syria specialists, I would like to apologize in advance if uh, some or most of what I will say today about Syrian history strikes you as rather uh, familiar. We're not breaking grounds, we're providing today a panoramic view of some of the fundamental contradictions in Syrian history over the last uh, 100 years. I'm actually particularly grateful for this opportunity because for the first time since 2011, this is the first time that I'm invited to speak and, and so reflect both privately and publicly not on the Syrian conflict, because that's what everyone wants to talk about these days, but actually on Syrian history. And indeed, the first thing that struck me as I sat to prepare for my talk, and that I think will serve us as a good entry point for our subject matter for this evening, is the fact, or is indeed the similar challenge that Syrian history and the Syrian conflict, the past and the present, as it were, presents or places upon the, any inquisitive mind, any interesting or interested uh, uh, examiner. It seems to me that in both cases, we confront a very difficult choice when we want to talk about the Syrian conflict today or when we want to talk about the Syrian history, the Syrian past. Should we start with the particular, with specific names, with key events, with local dynamics, or should we start with the universal, with global changes, external influences, and overarching structures of power? I feel this is a real dilemma. If we start with the local, we give voice to the experience of Syrians, of local actors, the, the Syrian women and men whose lives and ideas are usually very easily uh, uh, ignored in macro scale analyses of what's going on. And yet, at the same time, if we only focus on that, we risk, I think, losing ourselves in the uniqueness of Syrian history or the Syrian story. And when we're talking to a non-Syrian uh, uh, audience, this means that we provide a story which you will find textured, rich, interesting, but ultimately unrelatable. And maybe, in an extreme case, utterly alien and exotic. And conversely, if we start with universal dynamics, with the global uh, uh, influences, of course, we make uh, the Syrian story to a non-Syrian audience comprehensible, relatable, unexotic, and yet we risk um, uh, losing sight or ignoring uh, uh, local agency. The fact that Syrians have tried over the last hundred years, one way or the other, to establish some sort of ownership over their public condition, over their political uh, lives. And consider actually the parallel between the Syrian conflict and Syrian history in the two dominant images that we have today of the Syrian conflict. They embody these two tendencies to perfection. For on the one hand, Syria is either reduced to what to a Western mind is the most alien, the most exotic, the most barbaric and other, i.e. Islamic jihadism or primordial sectarianism. Or, on the other hand, it is simply reduced to a battleground of grand geopolitical forces, whether it's Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Iran, or the United States and Russia. And so, in a way, either we lose, on the one hand, the universal ideals that moved Syrians, just like they move today Norwegians and Europeans and Americans, or, on the other hand, we just focus on the universal and the global, and we forget about the attempts of every single Syrian person in his own local specific way to maintain his dignity inside Syria or outside Syria, and to preserve a sense of collective existence. And so, what I think I will do today, this is, I haven't even started my, 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 my lecture. Um, I think, instead of uh, providing you today with a linear narrative, 
that starts from 1916 when Mr. Uh, Georges Picot and Michael Sykes, the foreign ministers of the two most powerful empires in the world, decided to create a state that will c become to be known Syria up until 2011, which is when the Syrian revolution uh, uh, broke out. Um, I don't, I'm not going to pre present you with this narrative because I think it will inescapably and unconsciously err on one side or the other, either emphasizing the local but forgetting about the universal or vice uh, versa. Instead, what I want to do today is to actually provide you with, with a set of thematic arguments, thematic arguments about Syrian history, not a linear narrative, that confront the question of the external versus the local. How did the external forces and local agency, local voices, clash or dovetail in the making of Syrian history over the last 150 years, okay? Now, of course, when I say 150 years, that's already you asking questions, but Syria as a state only existed in 1916. It's actually, or 1920 actually, the Arab Kingdom was legally uh, uh, declared in 1920, so it's less than a century old, the Syrian state. And yet I'm talking about a century and a half. And this actually takes me to the very first argument that I want to make today, is that it is impossible to understand some of the most fundamental and deep divisions in Syrian society today without looking at some of the massive changes, socioeconomic changes and sociocultural changes that started sweeping the land that will become Syria from the mid-19th century onwards, particularly after 1860. Okay? Now, why do I say this? Because a lot of our assumptions about Syrian history make us assume that this comes from time immemorial, that all these problems in Syria, they are the result of a primordial culture. In fact, I will argue that the three most destabilizing factors in uh, uh, um, uh, Syrian history, the ones that changed it completely and, and, and sowed the seeds of uh, instability for the hundred years uh, to come, were actually the products of modernity. The first is, in fact, the way Syria was very unevenly incorporated into the world capitalist economy from the late 19th century onwards. I don't want to go into the details of political economy, but actually you can look and see some of the same uh, dynamics that you see now, how first it was then that the commercial primacy of Aleppo and uh, uh, Damascus was confirmed as a result of the destruction of manufacturing and the establishment of commerce as the only so main source of economy for Syrians because now we're just basically connected to European to the European uh, uh, economy we cannot compete with the uh, with the industrial revolution in Europe so we're basically the manufacturing is gone and basically we have we have commerce commerce as a main source of wealth it brings Aleppo and Damascus up it heightens the competition between Aleppo and Damascus. So this is a, a region where we don't have one dominant center, but actually two dominant centers. And within Aleppo and Damascus, th the, this, uh, this economic change will uh, begin the sort of rift between the, su the Muslim uh, commercial class, which was connected to Asian commerce or to intra-Ottoman commerce, and the Christian, the Catholics and the Orthodox Christians who lived in Aleppo and Damascus and had preferential treatment by uh, 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 Europe. At the same time, at the same time, the same change pushed the Syrian countryside down because it connected the agriculture of Syria to the commercial uh, markets. It made agriculture much more vulnerable to what was happening uh, uh, in the world. And basically it meant because it ended subsistence economy, which as we know existed up until the beginning of the industrial revolution, it basically meant that if you, if you, if there's a drought, you actually starve. You don't, you don't have, you don't have these pre, pre modern uh, uh, methods of uh, subsistence. And in fact, what's so interesting is that it was in the late 19th century that we start the wave of what will happen five years ago, the first wave of rural rebellions, rural rebellions by the countryside, inflicted by drought, inflicted by heavy taxing uh, system. And this, at the same time, also back then, 100 years uh, ago, will push, uh, will, will, will trigger the first waves of migration from the Syrian countryside to the cities. In fact, the two major uh, urban centers in Aleppo and in Damascus that now are still revolutionary centers and where the revolution took place were in fact established a hundred years ago as a result of these rural uh, uh, migrants. Al Midan in Damascus was established by Hurani migrants from Dara to, uh, uh, to Damascus and it became this 
center that is always ready to go up in arm against whoever was in power. And al kallasi in, in Halab was also again an urban center that was established as a result of this and that became part of Aleppo and yet as a result of the rural background of the people, it maintained the sort of distance from uh, the city. Now, what is that? I mean, we already have then a major difference between city and countryside, and we have already a major competition between Aleppo and Damascus, and we have an internal fraction somehow in the bourgeoisie between the Christian element and the Muslim element as a result of commercial competition. Now, this will be exacerbated. These fra this fractured society, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that modernity comes to Syria through fracturing its society, fracturing the elites, pitting them one against the other, and fracturing the between the elites and the non-elites, increasing the tension between elites and the non-elites. Non the second is the way the Ottoman state, from that point onwards, started asserting its administration, asserting its uh, power. And of course, as we know from Europe, when you want to assert your power, you create schools, you want to make everyone feel your citizens. Of course, the Ottoman state did not have this money. And so basically, they had to rely on whoever was in Syria powerful. They wanted them to become more assertive, to levy more taxes, to assert more control over the rural population. This, again, exacerbated city versus countryside tension. And for the first time since the late 19th century, the Ottoman state came into face-to-face -face interaction with two communities which up until then were sort of left alone. First, the Alawites in the, in the, in the, in the mountain from which the Assad family will ultimately, will ultimately stem. Um, and again, those people lived away from the central state, but now the state wants to be more assertive, so they're bringing them together, and this creates friction, actually. It doesn't bring love and, uh, and, uh, and peace, and we can see that in the, in the sources from that period. And it also, this is the first period when the Ottoman state starts to settling Kurdish tribes in the northeast of uh, uh, Syria because they wanted to, to, to they wanted to encourage settlement, because they wanted to encourage the economy, because they wanted to uh, raise uh, taxes. The third factor, and I'm sorry I'm going into detail, d detail a little bit, this is, this is quite crucial. The third is the fact that all this is happening when Syria is not just, or the land that will become Syria, is not just uh, a stable province part of the Ottoman Empire, it is actually a battlefield of competition between the Russian, the French, and the British empires who were trying to establish economic interests, who were trying to spread cultural uh, uh, missionaries and cultural schools, and who were most importantly presenting themselves as protectors, as patrons of the specific of the non-Sunni elements in uh, the Levant, of the Christians, of the Alawites, of the, I mean, France obviously was associated mostly with the, with the, with the Maronite in, in Mount Lebanon, but also the Catholics all over. And this meant that colonialism did not just assert itself in the normal way it did in India or in Egypt. You have a state and the state is, ru is ruling. And actually in Syria, you have a, a Syria is a battleground for competing empires, for competing colonialisms. And this competition manifests itself through one power trying to find a client or a one community inside Syria trying to find a patron. Uh, and so in a way, every civil conflict in the country was very easily transformable into an international proxy war. Again, this was established from the late 19th century onwards. Now, these are the three fundamental factors, and I will repeat them just again to just to highlight them. The first, as I said, is a, a deeply fractured society between elite and non-elite, between Aleppo and Damascus, between Sunnis and non-Sunnis, Sunni Muslims and non-Sunni Muslims or non-Muslims, uh, uh, Christians. These are the fundamental tensions in Syrian society that continue to inform its politics until today. The second is an increasingly intrusive state, and after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, this, this, the following states will only replicate and intensify their efforts not to represent the Syrian society, but actually to establish dominance over it, to control it, I mean, in terms of money and in terms of bodies, actually. And the third is this Syria as a battlefield for competing, for competing colonialisms, for different colonial missions. And in fact, the reason why I spent a lot of time going into the details of this is because I think, ironically, if we look at these three factors, the society, the state, and the competing colonialisms, we can understand the 100 years later, from 19, 
16, the establishment of the Sykes-Picot, 1920, the establishment of the Arab Kingdom of Syria, all the way to 2011, as the interplay of these three factors together, together, and that basically meant that you know uh, um, there are certain uh, the that the whoever was in power, whether it was the colonial state in the French ma in the French mandate or uh, the Assad regime under the Assad dynasty, they would basically, in order to maintain their rule and to assert their uh, uh, power over society, they would uh, invest and exploit the fact that the society, the elites and the non-elites, the different communities, the different regions, were deeply, deeply fractured. And so, in a way, we can, we can understand this as, you know, uh, colonialism and the state merge under the French mandate, and the French mandate was notorious for 20 years for basically exploiting all the uh, 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 intersectarian uh, differences in, uh, in Syrian society. Uh, f France actually came to uh, govern Syria to prepare to become a nation state, and so to actually uh, be based on the model of citizenship, and yet at the same time, throughout 25 years of rule, they basically made it very clear that they were there first and foremost to protect the, com the non-Muslim communities from the Muslim community, and thus, in fact, through this discourse, assert differences between these communities. The second thing that they did, which was very famous, uh, very important, is that basically they took non-Muslim elites, the Alawites, the, uh, well, not just elites, but Alawites, the Circassians, the Druze, uh, some, some Christians, and they sort of like channeled them into state uh, uh, institutions, so the civil service, the army, and the police. And this, in a way, will dovetail into our second, the intrusiveness of the state. The state is either an external body coming to assert its power, or it becomes an instrument in the hand of one community, one fraction against uh, uh, the other. It is never actually in, in, in a manifestation of the, uh, of, the, of the public will of the people, or representative government, or any of this, uh, any of this fanciful ideas that uh, you, you people in Europe have. So, um, and so basically, uh, what we see basically with the Assad dynasty, and this is maybe a point that we can discuss, I believe the Assad dynasty ruled very similarly like a colonial, like a colonial state. Uh, uh, and this is something worth, worth, uh, worth, uh, worth uh, talking about. There we see the intrusive state and the colonialism merging together in a dynasty that asserted itself as the sole negotiator on behalf of Syrians with the international with the international community, and yet at the same time, through 40 years of rule, establish its complete independence of society. You know, like uh, state uh, th through the Mukhabarat, through the, the army, the, the intelligence, basically the security, the security service, through the army, through the pol a police state, basically, uh, they replicated the same methods of how we define a colonial state. With your population, we do not negotiate and we do not represent. We either divide or we pacify. So either we exploit the differences that exist in Syrian society in order to assert the power of the regime, or basically when we cannot uh, uh, basically take advantage of these differences, we simply pacify, we bomb, we kill indiscriminately. And this happened in the 1980s when the Syrian state, and I think the earliest manifestation of its externality or of its colonial nature, bombed the entire city of Hama. And it's happening again today. I mean, it's been happening since 2011 uh, 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 onwards. The way the state metastasizes, uh, basically, I don't know if I pronounce this, I pron if I pronounce that right. Maybe I added an S. But uh, uh, it metastasizes into uh, uh, into a colonial state, into an external body that governs the society from uh, 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 outside. Now, if you ask me now, okay, so what happened to local agency? Where is the local agency? This is very depressing. There are these global structures, the modern economy, the capitalist economy, the modern state, the, uh, the way it appeared in Syria, obviously the modern capitalist economy as it appeared in Syria and stratified the people, and modern colonialism. So Syrians, where are they? And the state, even the state, the post-colonial state, which is you know, governed by Syrians putatively, I'm making the claim that it uh, was actually, it functioned as a colonial state representing the family, the dynasty, and the network of interests that connected it, not actually a community or any segment of Syrian uh, uh, society. This will take me to the second or maybe the third argument that I'm making here. The first was about the late 19th century. The second was about those three factors that I mentioned. The third argument is that over the last 150 years, I think the area that emerged for Syrians to resist the fact 
that they experienced modernity as fraction, they experienced modernity as an oppressive state, they experienced modernity as over-competing colonialisms. The one area that emerged in which they asserted their authorship of their history, their ownership of their collective existence, was culture. And so culture in this way, and this is an argument that some European historians actually make for Europe, that in times of political crisis, culture serves as an escape from the fact that we're politically impotent, we're politically unable to establish our own self-government, for instance, or to rule ourselves. And so I believe that from the late 19th century onwards, and this is where I shift to the local voices, Syrians basically excelled among the Arab elites in basically uh, uh, asserting a certain sense of, uh, 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 you know, uh, ownership of their modern history, of being modern through cultural production. And, you know, this is how I feel one should define modernity. There's modernization, which is socioeconomic, and modernity is actually the experience of you trying to be at home in this new modern structure, and this is what happened. Now, it's very important, uh, I want to provide you with a schematic look of the cultural production in Syria. So I'm shifting gear completely from economics and depressing facts to actually things that are a little more uh, lively and energizing. But um, uh, I don't want to basically romanticize culture. Of course, culture itself in Syria was implicated in the structures of power. And there's always in cultural production a certain combination of uh, collusion and subversion. You know, uh, culture uh, uh, reenacting uh, uh, these these fractures in society, and this we will get to in, in five minutes, but I will argue that still there was a certain subversive element that started resisting these three leviathans, these three structures, okay? Now, we see that starting with the, with the late 19th century, with the cultural movement that we know of as the Nahda, the, rena the Renaissance, and what's so interesting there is that uh, uh, um, Basically, people are confronting the problem at that point of elites uh, fighting one another, of uh, primarily the Muslims and Christians. W that, was the, that was the big problem in the 19th century. Now it's Sunnis and Shias. A hundred years ago, it was this, uh, the, Muslims and the, and the Muslims and the Christians. And so from those two elites, we see the emergence of the first wave of Syrian intellectuals. In Aleppo, people will know I'm from Aleppo, so I'm, I'm going to mention Aleppo first. Uh, uh, so uh, someone like Abdurrahman al-Kawakibi, uh, the very famous Christian family, the Greek Catholics, who were uh, wealthy, wealthy merchants and also saloniers, and people who started translating the works of the French Revolution to Arabic, the Marrash family, so basically Fathallah Marrash, his daughter Mariana Marrash, who was the, who was the first female salonier in uh, the Arab East, according to the chronicles uh, 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 of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Arab culture. Um, in Aleppo, and uh, her brother uh, uh, Francis, who basically traveled between France and the Ottoman Empire, and was very, very much influenced by the ideals of the, of the French Revolution. Basically, and in Damascus, we have similar figures. I mean, I don't want to go into the details. Tahir al-Jazairi, for instance, if anyone is, uh, is, uh, is interested. Adib Ishaq in Damascus. Later, we will see the emergence of the first feminist uh, Syrian, Marie, Marie Ajami, who was also a salonier and who started uh, working for uh, 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 gender rights and women's rights from the late, uh, late 19th century uh, onwards. This, I would describe, the project that these people uh, uh, represented, I would describe it as aristocratic liberalism. It is aristocratic, obviously, because it emerges within the upper echelons of society, and it is very much committed to the perpetuation of the governance of the upper echelons of society, the elites that I talked about, and yet it was a liberalism. It was a liberalism in the sense that it, it advocated a sense of uh, on the Muslim side, a reinterpretation of Islam so that we come together with the notion of citizenship, of equality before, uh, before uh, uh, the law. It was also a form of liberalism in the fact that it was uh, it revolved around the idea of constitutionalism, of opposing the Ottoman state, of the Ottoman bureaucracy that wants to control but not represent. And you know, Abdurrahman al-Kawakibi was one of the most outspoken critics of uh, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, and uh, uh, um, the most reliable story that we have of the way he died was that he was poisoned by uh, the Sultan's uh, spies in Cairo in 1902. Uh, 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 now, of course, as I said, there's a liberalism that has to do with culture, Islam and modernity can actually coexist together. That has to do with politics. We need to rationalize sultanic rule through a constitution and through a, a, a government. But of course, the blind spot of this liberal uh, aristocratic liberalism is the non-existence of the elites, of the non-elites. I mean, if the major reality of, the m of Syrian modernity is this wide gap between the countryside and the cities, 
And this is true, you know, I come from an urban mercantile family. I know certain people of my family who went to cinema in Aleppo in 1910 or in 1915. We were very much part of what was happening, Beirut, Alexandria, you know, we were very much part of the Mediterranean world. My, deep, my dear friend and, and mentor, Yasin al who spoke to you last year, comes from a, si a small town in, to the east of that in the countryside, where in the 1962, so basically 60 years after my ancestors saw cinema, 62, there was no TV, no cinema, no roads, no magazines, nothing. And houses in the countryside were still made of clay. So in the village that he grew up in. And so, I mean, this is, a, this is a real story. Now, we see the first, uh, the, the first breakthrough in cultural production against this gap between elite and non-elite with the emergence of the second wave in which, again, Syrians, uh, Syrian intellectuals, Syrian ideologues championed uh, intellectual production and cultural creativity in the Arab world. And this is the, era, the, the, the phase that I would call progressive anti-colonial nationalism or avant-garde nationalism. This emerge, uh, emerges from the 1930s to the 1940s to the 1950s and reaches its epitome in the 1960s. It was very much influenced by what was happening in Algeria, by what was happening in India. There was this cer a certain sense of a new, a new universalism that the the wretched of the earth, the brown and black people of the world will establish once the colonial empires are uh, gone. And again, you know, the first person who translated Franz Fanon to Arabic was Jamal Atassi in, uh, in uh, 1970, a Syrian, a Syrian, a Syrian uh, translator. They will also translate, uh, he will also translate Gramsci later. But this is a, this is a different, uh, different, uh, different conversation. Here we have several names, you know, we can talk about Michel Afla, we can talk about Salah al-Din al-Bitar, we can talk about Zaki, Zaki, uh, Zaki, Zaki al-Suzi. So the Ba'ath party, uh, 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 early, early ideologues. We can talk about a little bit uh, earlier, Sata al husari All these people people, what was interesting about them is that they tr uh, uh, overcame the sense of the elite and the non-elite, but at the expense of completely sacrificing, this is the irony of completely ultimately sacrificing uh, uh, a democracy, of liberty, of constitutionalism. Basically, we create one strong nation. There are no big families and aristocrats and riffraff. We're all one big nation. We're all supposed to be, to, to be members of the same patrie, members of the same homeland. And yet somehow what we need is not representative democracy and all of the stuff that will make us waste time. We need to achieve progress. And this is what we do through a strong state, a strong leader. And I wish I had the USB where I had some slides to show you. You know, there were all these like, you know, uh, songs from that time, uh, operettes, uh, basically, of like Syrian, Egyptian, uh, Lebanese singers from different regions coming and singing about the Arab world and how it's all going to come together and become one nation. And then from the background, you have the emergence of the most iconic Arab leader of the, at the time, Jamal, Jamal, Jamal Abdel Nasser. I mean, the individual there, it becomes the uh, uh, encapsulation of this hope of the, of the nation. So we lose this sort of like liberal moment, but at the same time, we create some sort of a, um, a modus vivendi between the elite and the non-elite. The last phase that I want to talk about, and this will take us to the Syrian uh, re revolution, is that after 1967, um, Syrians again, uh, and, and some of you who study Syria will recognize names. Uh, the crisis in Arab, in the crisis in Arab culture, the crisis in Arab modernity, the crisis in Arab secularism and liberalism, as a result of the defeat against Israel, as a result of the notion that Nasser failed to create a strong, progressive, post-colonial uh, uh, state, coupled with the fact that now we have these you know, Leviathan states, dictatorships that are oppressing us, coupled with the fact that now we have all this oil money coming from the Gulf and creating new elites that do not have the same values that we sort of nurtured over a hundred years. All of this uh, uh, come together to create a certain crisis of culture, what sort of real culture we want to produce, and what, what and, and a crisis of um, the state, what, what, what sort of state we want. And so here the nation goes back to the background and people start debating What's the problem in the Arab world? Is the problem cultural? Are we to start basically from working on every single Arab so that he can become modern and understand modern notions and they become secular and liberal and all of this? This, you know, the most representative voices of this will be the Syrian poet Adonis. The problem first and foremost lies in culture. It lies in tradition. It lies in Islam. And obviously what I was saying today 
testifies that I completely disagree with him. <laughs> but on the, on the other hand, are the people who asserted the primacy of the political, that basically the main crisis of the Arab world was as a result of this development of this Leviathan post-colonial state that was completely oppressing its people, that was replicating colonial methods in segregating and uh, uh, pacifying, bombing cities, torturing th tens of thousands of people, mm, you know, ruling through terror, basically. And, um, and that the key to changing Arab reality and Arab society is through democracy. It is through human rights. It is through uh, political, political, political liberalism. It is a political problem before be being a cultural problem. It belongs to modern times, and it has to do with action, not just with writing books and, and going around and talking about, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, still a lot of Syrians go to mosque as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, reading, uh, reading, uh, uh, the Marquis de Sade or any of the any of the more libertine uh, literature that Adonis likes. So um, <laughs> that was that was a low blow, completely unnecessary. So <laughs> I take it back. So I think one of the I, th I think one of the one the thing that I want to conclude with is that, as I said, culture was the area in which Syrians try to establish ownership of their modern lives and resist some of the authoritarian structures that modernity gave, gave, gave them in the shape of the capitalist economy as it manifested itself, in the shape of the, of the state, the colonial and the post-colonial uh, state, and in fact, in, through actual external, uh, external uh, uh, influences and, and, and uh, international uh, competition over the, over the country. And yet, at the same time, as I said, culture is always complicit. And one of the things that strike one is that when, when, I mean, I used to study intellectual history, I used to be ob obsessed about intellectual history, and then when the revolution started, it felt that everything that I was studying did not matter at all. Uh, because for the first time, actually, when we, we where I ended the story is that people who are obsessing about culture, and those are elitist, they want to change things, but even the people who were talking about politics, you know, uh, some of our main friends in the 1990s, the way they lived, it was around the Salon, it was around writing manifestos of intellectuals against the state, it was calling for gradual democratization, gradual reform uh, from Assad, even though people mostly knew that Assad, the Assad family was not interested. But this was the mode, the mode, uh, the mode of operation, you know, elites, intellectual elites, intelligentsia confronting a state. And then what happened with the revolution? It was not the elites. It was not the intellectuals, it was not Damascus and Aleppo, it was not the liberal bourgeoisie or any bourgeoisie, it was actually the rural public. And this is the most important, I think, element in the story of the Syrian revolution. It's that the people with really no voice, historically, neither in the state nor in culture, who ultimately took things into their own hands. And, um, and I believe that if we are to continue now, and I think, I mean, this is my uh, concluding moment. I talked about a lot of things, and so I hope I did not, I did not scatter your minds too much. But um, I think now we're back to a moment where, after two years in 2011, 2012, we felt it was a moment for Syrians to assert ownership of their public lives, of their politics, of their state. And now that moment has, 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 has passed. And none of us, I think, Syrians share any sort of optimistic vision that we will be able, as Syrians, to assert control over our destiny, political destiny, in the 5 to 10, 20 years as a result of all the competing interests in the country. And so we are back at a moment when culture emerges again. And culture here broadly construed, not just theater or drama or movies, but also the fight for meaning. I mean, the fight to interpret what's happening, this is also a fight for culture. I mean people who that we call now in the NGO language advocacy. I mean, I, c I, I consider them cultural, cultural, uh, cultural practitioners. And I think we're back at this moment where we need to use our cultural uh, uh, tools, but I hope that this time, and you know, we can talk about this later, it will be non-elitist, it will be much more rooted in the realities of the Syrian, of the Syrian uh, uh, society, and that, by definition, means it will engage the history of the Syrian people, the detailed history, the history of the communities, uh, 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 much more, much more deeply. Of course, this is very reassuring for me. I'm a historian, recommending that we need to go back to history, but uh, this is what uh, this is what you get. So, thank you, thank you.